Great. All right, everyone, settle down, please. Let me teach you how to code like a rock star. Okay. So I want to help you achieve your science dreams this week. Um, Sorry, I have a question. Do rock stars code? Yes. Which rock star are we talking about? Is it Carnegie or is it Mick Jagger? Or like... Yeah, all of the above. <laughs> I think you know the answer to that. I'm just joking. Um, okay. So here is the, uh, I have like summaries in increasing level of detail, but here is the one slide summary. There's this balance when you're coding stuff between getting things done in like quickly, efficiently, just like given what you know now, all the imperfections, you know, you know, embracing all the imperfections. Can you do the thing that you're trying to do? And then on the other side, there's like, what is the optimal way of solving some task? And uh, one way of thinking about, uh, especially kind of what you're doing this week, is you should care nearly exclusively about just getting something. So whether you come up with a, the perfect solution, like just ignore, don't even try to come up with a perfect solution. You're, it's going to take too long. And it's going to kind of prevent you from exploring fully. So get something um, like really hacked together, the kind of jankier the better, and uh, get it to work. And your only goal is you want it to work, however terrible. OK. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the summary. OK. Um, to get us in the right mindset, I thought we could kind of meditate on this uh, poem. What? Are these slides online? Yes. And in fact, you can get this poem if you open up Python and you say, import this, you will get this printout. And it'll tell you how to code. Um, I don't, I'm not going to read it. Um, it's, it's pretty funny if you like, you know, if you just uh, look, read the Wikipedia page of the Zen of Python, uh, it says there are 20 aphorisms about like how to code in Python, but only 19 have been written down. So there are only 19 here. Um, <laughs> um, okay. Uh, cool. Okay. So, uh, how do you like get like kind of a minimum viable product? Uh, you should start your projects this week with a GitHub repository. So we learned from Eshin how to do that. And uh, I think we had a question about how frequently you should commit and push. And my personal view, which I think is the only really acceptable view, is that you should commit and push extremely frequently, like every few lines even, if you want. Um, anytime you do kind of a... I mean, you want to be coding in tech, like every line should mean something, right? So if the rule is every time you do something meaningful, you commit, then every line you could commit. Um, it's kind of when you complete a thought. Since my thoughts are very short, <laughs> I, I commit very frequently. And then when do you push? Well, if, you, if your computer were to die or like, you know, you drop it, I'm very clumsy. I'm always dropping things. If you don't want to lose your work, pushing backs your stuff up to the internet. And then who cares? You know. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. There's no real cost to committing very, very frequently. Um, okay. So that's yes. So that case, can I ask you a question again about whether it's worth automating it so that you, you just write some script that just yeah. commits every two seconds or something? I mean, you could. So the way GitHub stores files is it only stores incremental uh, kind of like the differences between changes. So there's no, aside from a, like one line of text in the log file, which takes basically no space, there's no real cost to just committing extremely frequently. It's not like it stores a full extra copy of your file every time you commit. Um, 
So the more you commit, the more fine-grained your history is. Does that make it more difficult in reverting back to previous changes? If it's hard to define the changes, does that matter? Well, uh, perhaps, but it's really like increasing the resolution of your time machine. So, yes. Well, I guess I disagree. I, I would say you can kind of explore your history of changes. So if, you, if you're like working on one particular file, you can just go back to each of your commits and see how the file changed from commit to commit. So yes, if you want to find like your change from a year ago, you're not going to remember what it was unless you have a nice commit message. But um, I don't know. There are different approaches. Yes? Alternative way is also to just add a staging array. So instead of creating a commit, you can have, OK, this one works. I just deep add dash u. Add sure. a staging array, all updated files, right? So you know that this one, this one wasn't working. It's not yet committed. I am not yet ready to subscribe. And then you keep working, breaking things, right? Because the danger with committing is broken code. Mm -hmm. Then later on, you go back around. This seems to be the right spot. No comments, right? And um, you end up in broken code, right? So that's a great point. So I mean, my my approach to that is I usually write. So if if I'm uh, committing something broken, I'll include like in square brackets WIP work in progress. Then I know if I see a commit message with that tag, it's not going to work, but it's something I backed up. Um, and then if I have a working thing, like a function finally works or, or whatever, then I'll say that in the commit message. So that kind of allows you to go back quickly. Um, so yeah. Actually, so you have grades, but for me, that none of this would work. OK. The rapid committing. Just like trying to find if it disrupts the flow or something, or I have to think about it. Is it worth like the point, is it the point or not? So what I do is I develop code in Dropbox, so if like, my computer dies or there's a fire, mm. then I can track it, whatever. But then I commit it when I feel like this is a chunk that is done. This is a function that, like, you know, I'm fine with it being there. So it's not every thought, but it's, you know. But then Dropbox is every second. It's basically, you keep track of all the things. Cool. That sounds reasonable. <laughs> OK. That's my first point. My second point is, uh, yeah, find solutions that work even if they're messy. Um, and if you uh, have a messy solution to the thing you're working on, that's what you should use. But then if you kind of want to make a note to come back to it later, um, either in inline comments or GitHub issues, just remind yourself, OK, this was a hacked together solution. Someday I might want to come back to it and clean it up. And then you can if you want or not. Um, I've found that to be useful. And finally, um, Yarick mentioned this, but many people have solved many interesting problems already. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If there's a good solution out there or even a working solution that's not good out there, you can copy it, put it in your code, and that is a faster way to get something working than coding it from scratch. And that's super useful during kind of hackathon projects where coding Everything from scratch is just going to take too much time. Yes? I was going to say, trust but verify. Mm. And so if there, there's a lot of bad code on the internet. And one has to, the fact that somebody says, I wrote a piece of code that does this magic, you know, complex statistic, does not mean that that random code did that complex statistic. So you need to Great point. Way let alone whether it's what they say they've done. Great point. Um, yes. Uh, my, my preferred workflow is I like using Docker containers. Um, it means that whatever kind of, you know, at least on my system, I have like a gazillion versions of Python that are all, it's like 
4, 3.5, 3.6, 3.7, and like different packages are installed in each one. It's a complete mess. Um, and I, like many of the, one of the uh, inconvenient aspects of Python is that libraries, um, because kind of any random person on the internet can develop these libraries, they're not as vigilant about preserving backwards compatibility as one would like. And so like NumPy will sometimes update, you know, to a new version, and then that will break some syntax that you've used previously. And that's hard to keep track of. Um, so Docker containers allow you to maintain a stable environment. Um, I also, when I start a project, I use a Jupyter notebook to kind of uh, outline the basic functionality of the project. Um, and in the first cell, I always import kind of the same libraries. OS lets you interact with your file system and also run basic system commands. NumPy and pandas give you kind of data wrangling powers. And then matplotlib and seaborn give you plotting powers. Um, I nearly, every project I've worked on, I import those libraries first. Um, and then I come up with a toy data set, which could be kind of a carved off piece of your full data set that you're going to want to kind of play with. And the point is not that you're only going to limit yourself to a toy problem, but it's that as you're developing code, you don't want to have every line of your analysis take like hours and hours to run. So even if your analysis is some complicated thing, it could be really useful to just have a kind of very small toy example where you can just run something in a few seconds. And then if you're doing that hundreds of times, your time, you know, it allows you to finish as opposed to take a year developing. Um, later, and then, you know, later, once you have the minimum functionality in place, you can scale things up by adding a little bit at a time. Um, I also find a really important thing to do is to visualize your data pretty much constantly. So, you know, if you add a step to your analysis, visualize the result before and after. How did your data change? And that can be literally printing out the numbers or making some figure or plot. That's super important to just do constantly. Um, and then uh, really, when you're kind of developing a new project, don't worry about making it run quickly. Just get the thing done. And uh, if there's some step that takes a long time, save the answer after you've run it once and load the answer in next time. Then you don't have to keep running it. Okay. Any, yeah. Ah, yes. So uh, these, so NPY and MPZ files are uh, NumPy file types. So NPY is like an uncompressed uh, NumPy data structure, and then NPZ is the compressed version. Um, you can, both of these file types allow you to name specific variables and then load them in. Um, if you're used to coding in MATLAB, they're kind of like the NumPy versions of .mat files. Um, and then PKL files are called uh, pickle files, and they let you turn any Python object into a uh, savable file that you can load in and get it back into your Python workspace. Yes? Hmm. Like if I just said I'm in my Jupyter notebook and I just want to save the whole thing as a as a thing, right? Like, you know. So there's like commands for listing all of the variables in your workspace, mm -hmm. and you can, I mean, you could write a one-liner that will save all the variables in your workspace as like a, as a num npy file or something like that. See, yeah. Yeah, um, I don't know that that's ever a good idea because it's like when, like your Python workspace is going to contain potentially enormous libraries that you've imported, and those are going to be part of your workspace. So like you might have a many gigabyte 
file, whereas in MATLAB, it ignores, it knows like, okay, well, I have the statistics toolbox in MATLAB, but I'm not going to save a copy of that toolbox, even though it's accessible from my workspace. Yeah, so any of these file types will allow you to do that. Um, Yeah, HDF5, uh, H, uh, so yeah, there's a, there's a HD5 and then there's Deep Dish. Uh, there's a few libraries that are kind of made for file IO and like saving your workspaces. Personally, I've found, so pickle files are not like Python 2.3 compatible unless you pass in particular options. Most people are now using Python 3, so it doesn't really matter. But if that's an issue, if you want to have uh, Python 2.3 compatibility, then you have to use a special flag in Python 3 in order to allow the file to be read in Python 2. That um, makes sense, because Pickle in Python 2 was very inefficient. I think it was in Python 2, maybe it was in Python 1, which is still the whole thing. Uh, Pickle was very inefficient and produced very large, wasteful files that you didn't really want. So is that the only problem with Pickle? Did, uh, you have something I should Yeah, I was just going to say, in general, it depends on what you're saving. <clears throat> so, for example, if you're sa if you're if folks are familiar with Python, like the object-oriented language, mm -hmm. if you're saving object instances or class instances and stuff oh, like that, great for that. Pickle is, is OK. It, yeah, it basically you don't have other options really yeah. most of the time. <laughs> but it's not guaranteed to be stable either. So, for example, if you're using the same piece of software and that library on site, to, or for example, it's updated a version, there's no guarantee that the Pickle instance from a previous okay. version will work. And, and this That's is right. not a Python issue, this is just yeah, an object-oriented like data storage issue, right? There isn't a good solution for that, basically. But if you're trying to sort of save types that sort of um, are not going to change between language updates, like arrays or strings or numerical types and stuff, then you can, in theory, pick all them and it'll be stable. But HDF5 tends to be a much faster way to do that and also is way more memory efficient and also has flags for maximizing compatibility in, 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 you know, in, in a, a, a while maybe increasing the price. 
those of you who want to make like computational models and you want to write your own object and save instances of code, it's it's always I think the only option, but I'm not sure. Yeah, you, I couldn't find a better right. way. And most actually take care five logic that I've already talked about will actually fall back to take away when they can't actually create the type for you. But mm -hmm. you basically are kind of you don't have a, there is no good solution for sort of uh, like sort of in object persistence on disk, which would be sort of like classic computing stuff. Yeah. Cool. Food for thought. For Yeah, um, let's see, I'll, I'll kind of skip things. Um, okay, so I, I just have a few kind of more tips and tricks. So uh, when you're thinking about, so there's the philosophy of just, you know, something is better than nothing and you want a, a messy solution, it will get you there quicker than a correct, or not correct, you always want your stuff to work correctly, but a uh, kind of the best possible solution. Um, so uh, to, when you think about how to get things done quickly, it's often helpful to think about how can you do things simply. And simple, my favorite definition of simple is the art of, simplicity is the art of maximizing the amount of work not done. So that means using other people's code, uh, not rewriting stuff a gajillion times, uh, you want to write functions once and then reuse it a lot. Um, do you want to solve the most complicated thing first? No, you should solve the easiest thing first and then move on from that and then use the easy things to kind of, you know, building together the easy things to solve more and more uh, complicated tasks. Also, if you have a complicated task that you're trying to figure out and you don't know how to solve it right away, the best way uh, in my experience, to solve it is to break the complicated down, the thing down into its constituent parts and then solve each piece. And if a piece is too complicated, you have to break it down further. Eventually, you'll get down to some kind of atomic operation like printing something or multiplying a matrix with another matrix. And uh, you know anything that's too complicated, you just have to drill down and break it apart. OK, any questions on that or thoughts? OK. Um, one uh, philosophy that helps to achieve uh, simplicity is uh, called modular programming. The idea is to uh, write what are called modules, which are kind of functional units that each accomplish some task. And then some of your modules could be simple and basically just call kind of native Python built-in commands or native uh, calls to particular libraries. And then you want to take those modules and combine them to form more complicated modules, which in turn are combined to form more complicated modules. And when you design code in this way, it allows you to achieve simplicity by reusing things over and over again. And basically, if you have the same line of code that's going to be called multiple times, you it's very important to write it just once. Um, if you find yourself in a position where you're kind of copying things multiple times. I think we've all done this because we want to like get things done quickly. It's actually terrible shortly after the convenience of like not making a separate function because then you realize, oh wait, there's a bug in like version three of the copy. So I fix that and version like one, two, four through, you know, a thousand is all wrong. How do you remember which parts you fixed and which parts you haven't fixed. Versus if something's a module, you just fix the bug in the module and then everywhere else in your code is suddenly working. Um, okay, I'm gonna kind of skip a bunch. Um, okay, when you're writing code, um, Luke mentioned some people are fanatics about kind of style of coding and I am a fanatic about style of coding. Um, the correct style of coding is called <laughs> PEP8. And this link provides a very nice description of how to code in PEP8. I'm, I'm kind of joking. I, I like PEP8. It doesn't particularly matter what style you use as long as you're consistent within whatever library or 
package or project you're working on. And kind of keeping a consistent style allows you to you know, read your code quickly. Um, yes, OK. I, I would encourage you to check out that link. And it's just a fascinating, fascinating topic. Um, OK. Uh, some, uh, basically, you want your code to be visually clean. Uh, one of the, my favorite things about Python is that because white spaces are meaningful in Python, code is necessarily nicely formatted because like, you know, having different numbers of indents will change the meaning of your code in Python. Um, but there are some white spaces that are optional, um, and it's nonetheless useful to maintain a consistent style. Um, I like to use white spaces around operators. Um, and then kind of when you're grouping different lines that do things together, you want to kind of keep lines grouped that are forming a functional unit. Um, you shouldn't use a lot of comments. Your code should just be so clean and intuitive that you don't need to comment. What? Yeah. Well, all of this is my opinion, but So, I so to clarify, um, it's I, I find it super disruptive when you have like it's like you're adding two numbers together and then you have a comment right before that's like next I'm going to add a to b yeah, that's right true. that's there's overkill right then there's a I uh, the other extreme is just like nothing is documented obviously that's bad right um, but a kind of happy well. It's towards the end of fewer comments, but you know, having some description of what are the inputs and outputs of your function, that's obviously critical, right? So we want that. But within a function, functions should themselves be simple enough that it's just clear what they do. So that's kind of the balance that I think is nice. Um, Luke, I think it was Luke, maybe it was Yark, uh, mentioned Sphinx, uh, which is like a documentation I guess, organizer. Um, if you have, uh, at the beginning of a function, kind of a comment formatted in a particular way, it will create a web page out of your function documentation um, that kind of makes an API for you, uh, which is wonderful for sharing your packages and code. OK, that, that I would say is a technicality, but sure. <laughs> OK. <laughs> it's a dog. It's not even a comment. Yeah. OK. Yeah, no, it's a piece of text in your code that doesn't run, well, <laughs> but it's not a comment. This yeah. Is a string, right? OK. There's no string describing your function, so you, again, you don't have to have any comments, but you have really extensive block string, which provides examples, which provides description of interface, right? And there you go. There you go. Um, here, here's kind of a summary of some of the PEP8 highlights. If you have a, uh, you know, there are different styles of, of variables you could have. So, you know, a single lowercase letter, where would you use those? Like loop operators, um, minor scalars, um, matrices, those are capital single letters, or if you have more than. I don't know, sometimes I combine letters and numbers. Um, uh, kind of variables that are meaningful. Uh, I like either lowercase uh, kind of single names or case words separated by underscores if you need a longer description. Um, constants, which are kind of a controversial topic in 
programming land, but sometimes I do find them useful. Um, we can debate that. Uh, but I like uppercase letters for constants. Uh, classes, that's camel case. Um, and then mixed case, well, all these things you should just not do. Uh, function names, I often use uh, like lowercase for functions, personally. Really, the important thing is to be consistent. Um, I'm a little bit joking with the, you know, you should never use certain things. Use whatever you want, but just be consistent. Okay. Um, just as an example, like here's, this, is, this code is kind of hard to read. Um, it's got a lot of, too many comments. There's not a consistent format for the kind of function and variable names. Um, the spacing is a little odd. This code does exactly the same thing, but it's a lot easier to read. Okay, So perhaps that motivates writing clean code. Okay. Um, another principle that I think is really useful, um, I call it funneling. Uh, and it's especially useful for working with the different types of data that we'll be using uh, in the coming week. So maybe you'll have rat electrophysiology data, and you want to do the same analysis on kind of electrophysiology data as you do for like an fMRI data set. But one comes in like a CSV file or an EDF file or a NIFTY file, et cetera. Um, but you might want the same code to like do the main analyses. And so the idea of funneling is you write some function that just takes your data in whatever messy format and returns a consistently formatted Python object. It could be a class that you define, it could be a NumPy array or a pandas data frame. Um, and that function is the one that's going to support all of your different wonky file types. That means that later on in your code, you don't have to care about file types anymore. You can just assume that your data are formatted in the way that's returned by your data format function. And that's all you have to support later on. It substantially reduces your coding burden, because you only have to check data types once. Okay. Um, OK, so here's kind of a very simple example of how this kind of works in practice. So maybe you have some function that makes brain plots, and your data c is a variable that could happen, you know, come in in whatever format, and you don't know what that format is, you know, later on in your function, but have your kind of data format function that can take whatever mess you pass in, and it will return something specific that you kind of has a known format. Got it? OK. OK. Um, I'm going to skip this stuff. Uh, OK. Another useful tool is uh, called storyboarding. Storyboarding is particularly useful when you're developing packages. The idea is you want to develop use cases. Think of, like, how are people going to use my code or use my analysis? And um, the idea is you want to describe kind of like a little couple sentences or a paragraph of like, you know, how a user might interact with your project or your code. And each story that you write is some use case that you're going to want to support. And then if the story doesn't exist in your storyboard, you don't have to support it. OK. Does that make sense? OK. Um, I'll zoom through the rest. Uh, you need to test your code. It's super, super important. Um, so um, if you're copying random code off the internet, you don't know what it does. The downside to getting a free kind of someone doing your homework for you is you don't know what the code does, right? So you need to have some test that verifies that what you think is happening is actually happening. So uh, one way of doing this is to take known data apply a known function, maybe hand computed, 
and then kind of hard code in the answer that you should get out after kind of running through your processing pipeline. And then as you change your code, you want to verify you get the same answer each time. Do you need to test your code? Everyone needs to test their code. So if you're writing a quick project, if you don't test your code, we don't know what you've just done. Like you've just, it might as, yeah, it just has no meaning. Um, okay. Uh, are you exempt from testing your code? No, you're not. You have to do it, right? Okay, that means you. Okay, and how do you decide what to test? Well, if you storyboard your code, you can make sure, okay, if these are the use cases I want my code to support, that's what needs to be tested. You need to verify that the way people will use your code in the way that you're imagining are going to continue to work. Okay, and uh, in my lab, we use uh, this uh, PyTest, which is, I think, built into Python. And then Travis CI, when we do a pull request of a project, it kind of builds a little container, runs you know, with different versions of Python in different containers, and then it runs all our tests in those containers. And then that ensures that when we change our code, it works in some predefined set of environments. And it's, it's just a super convenient way of making sure that we don't break it. Uh, yep. Things that we share in the world are not broken unless we know they're broken. We break things all the time, but we know. Um, okay. Uh, debugging is a uh, obviously an important thing to do, but I'll zoom through uh, just a very quick trick. There are kind of two strategies for debugging. Lucy uh, kind of briefly touched on one way of debugging in PyCharm, and that's a wonderful debugger for kind of more complex debugging. A quick and uh, a quicker way to debug is in Jupyter Notebooks. So you can kind of set up your workspace in one cell, and then uh, it's nice to kind of have a sequence of three cells uh, that always occur in the same order. The first one resets your workspace, so it gets rid of all the junk that you've added, loads in all your data or variables, defines your functions, et cetera. Uh, sorry, doesn't define your functions. In the second cell, it defines the function that you're trying to debug. So that's the thing that you're going to kind of modify. And in the third cell, it's going to run your function and display the result. So the way you debug is you just keep looping through these three cells in sequence. And then every time you change the second cell in that sequence, you can always get back to your original workspace by running the first cell again. That makes sense? Okay. Meditate on this. Yes. Oh, that's a particular library for plotting things. Yeah, it's called HypoTools. Okay. Um, okay. So this week, uh, you're not trying to solve every problem. Your goal in the hackathons is going to be create minimum viable products, some really hacked together solution that works. And you want to do that quickly and efficiently without w really wasting time on optimization or making code pretty, et cetera. Later, when you decide you're going to take your projects and publish them, you can clean up your code and make it fast and all that. Keep things simple. Uh, remember. Some code is better than no code, so don't worry about making it perfect. It's helpful to use storyboards to organize your thoughts. Funneling, modularity are good. And then uh, ask each other for help and learn from each other. You're all good at different things and different aspects of coding, and uh, leverage that and get better at coding. Um, and then as a corollary, help other people when they ask you. Thanks.